and it is now eight o'clock. We are uh -oh. now supposed to be doing, um, or it's eight o'clock on our end, I should say. <laughs> uh, so it's, we are now doing publishing, traditional versus self-publishing. And like I said, uh, we have, how many books do we have between us? Oh, more than 20. Yeah, and, and we actually started out with a publisher. Um, that publisher went out of business. Uh, we were very, very, very lucky to get our rights back. Otherwise, he would have lost his trilogy and I would have lost um, my series, which I was halfway through, um, had we not gotten those rights back. So if you do go into uh, traditional publishing, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just, well, even in the furry realm, um, look at your contract. Um, now, the furry realm, obviously, we have uh, a very nice um, niche market, um, and most of the publishers um, technically are a heck of a lot easier to get a hold of than, than some of the big publishers. I mean, hey, you go to the convention, you might bump into one of them. Um, Ringtail Cafe is actually a, 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 a Darren and Sal and, and their family are, are, are good friends of ours. And um, you get to hear a lot of stories. I can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have an advantage in the furry fandom where they're a little, that publishers are a little more accessible, well, a little easier to, easier to work with. Yes, but we've also made every mistake possible. and We've hit every landmine along the road. That is true, but that was before we found the furry fandom. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, great thing about self-publishing is, well, maybe I, should I, should we go with the, the publishing, the, the, uh, mainstream publishing first before we go into self-publishing so we don't don't bounce back and forth yeah let's keep it simple okay so when it comes when it comes to just a minute i have <clears throat> this is montgomery he likes to try and ruin my computer <laughs> aka fuzz butt or pain in the butt anyways um in traditional publishing, and, and we're going to say outside the, the furry realm, um, you have your, your your big five or six, depending on the day, um, which you basically, in order to even think about sub submitting to them, um, you 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 really need an agent because um, they they don't they don't take unsolicited stuff. So th that's the that's the big guys on top, and then you have your mid range. Um, which some of them require an agent, some of them don't. And then you have your lower tier, which um, you really don't need an agent. You just kind of have to pay attention to what's on their website, what they, um, what they want. And one of the things, there's two things here. Pay attention to, if you're going to um, submit to, a, a publisher pay attention to their website and what their requirements are. Um, you don't want to be submitting, say, romance or erotica to uh, sci-fi or horror or vice versa, um, because you're you're not going to get anywhere. They they get so many emails per day. I mean, if if they have to go through a hundred emails per day. But sometimes more in submissions. Um, if soon and they say they focus on primarily horror. If you're submitting something that's not that they're not, um, they don't deal in, they don't have the marketing for it. They're just going to delete your email. And a lot of places will not um, um, get back with you. Um, and, and it, I know it's 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 kind of depressing, but you know it's easy to hit the delete button. Um, and another thing you want to look for is research that publisher. 
because it is so easy nowadays for somebody to be working out of their basement. And, you know, are they a legit publisher? Um, are they going to pay attention um, to what they're doing or are, are they, I don't know. I yes. just want to preface that here we're not talking about uh, furry publishers. Right. Uh, the, the Furry Writers Guild has a very nice list of, of mm -hmm. people, uh, of publishers, what they want specifically at this time. Uh, and there are no horrible choices. Um, they're that all is true. good. Um, what we're talking about, though, is if you wanted to go wide on Amazon or if you wanted to, to branch out to uh, more of a mainstream audience as well. And uh, there is a lot of temptation to, uh, to uh, go with small, pro uh, small uh, publishers, watch out. Uh, and agents, some, some places will require an agent. There are plenty of people who are predatory, uh, predatory scam, agents. A lot of scam artists out there. Uh, so um, be very, very careful and do your research. Yes. If, if in, in the, I want to say secular, but that's not the right word. Um, mainstream, mainstream publishing. Um, and never, ever, never uh, pay for anything, never pay for anything. You, you should not have to pay someone to publish your book. That would be considered a vanity press. Um, another thing um, that publishing nowadays is very, very different than what it was years ago. Um, people think, oh, I'll just write a book, send it in. If, I, if they accept me, then I can just sit back and relax and, and let the, the, um, the royalties roll in. Well, that's not, a, not the case anymore. Um, even if you get with a publisher, that publisher, no matter what tier they're on, is going to expect you to do a certain amount of marketing. And I know that that just really sucks. Um, so that's another thing of, of read your contract because you don't want to have uh, your paying job, the one that pays your bills, uh, wanting you in San Francisco and your book publisher and contract is, is telling you to be in New York. Um, that's, that's not a good thing. So really look at your contract, know what you're getting into. Um, I even know one person who, who, uh, uh, one person had a lawyer check it out and another person had an agent check their contract out. Um, and both of them, was said, you know, said, okay, this, 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 and this, and this, you need to get changed. And, you know, there's a lot of things you don't really think about. Um, so then there's self-publishing and it kind of, when it comes to self-publishing, it kind of makes the, the, the traditional publishers, it's like, what can they really do for me? You know, what, you know, what are you looking for? Are you looking for that? rubber stamp of saying, hey, someone like my stuff, my stuff enough to get it published? Or do you want to do it yourself and be in control of everything? And I always tell people, the best thing about self-publishing is you are in control and responsible for everything. The worst thing about self-publishing is you are in control of everything and you are responsible for everything. <laughs> so, um, and there, uh, when it comes to, to publish the self-publishing, um, I mean, Amazon is, is, is relatively easy. At least I thought it was. I mean, when, when our old publisher went out of business, we got everything, um, all our stuff back. Uh, I had to spend a year editing everything and I, I, I probably shouldn't go into the entire horror story and trust me every uh, every author has their own horror story <laughs> it was an absolute mess um but we wanted our stuff back online we wanted to continue writing 
and we just didn't really want to we wanted control we didn't want to go through trying to find another publisher and then having to do to, to deal with um a owner who was a control freak or psychotic um editors um <laughs> Yeah, I, I, had, uh, I, I plus, got hit with a few. Uh, with um, with uh, traditional publishing, uh, you're pretty much locked into um, yeah. maybe one book a year at max. If, if you want to, to write and you have lots of stories and you want to pump them out there, um, a regular publisher probably isn't going to be interested. Um, yeah, they're they're looking for the next next best best thing. They're actually a lot of pu publishers are looking for what's going to be popular uh, two three years down the road because in a um, in a mainstream publishing um, that's not furry, um, they're you know, they're looking at the dollar. They're, they're looking at the almighty dollar and they're looking at, okay, how much money can I make off of your story? And if it's what's popular today, um, they may not want it. They might, they, they'll probably want something. Okay, they're trying to guess what's going to be popular a couple years from now. Yeah, so you can't write the story you want. You have to write the story they want. Yeah, and that's that's. In fact, we know of somebody who they had a trilogy, and the their publisher wanted to make it like five five books, um, because I, I'm not sure of the the things, but she had to do a lot more writing, and she absolutely hated, absolutely hates prologues, and. Oh my gosh, they made her put a prologue in every one of her books and she just almost had a meltdown. <laughs> um, so you there is there is some things where you can't with a regular publisher, with a mainstream publisher, you can't always do what you want. And that's what's nice about self-publishing is you're in control um, of what you want to write when you want to write and when it's released um so that's that's always that's always fine I've oh yeah that's a good one right there wait a minute i've heard horror stories of publishing waiting a month before the contract before rushing to get it out um yeah uh by the way some of never include a sequel in the contract that yes yes until you've already written it definitely yeah because actually that that happened to me and my publisher I, uh, was, was going out of business and I... Uh, Which we didn't know at the time. We didn't know. And of course they didn't tell us. And uh, I, I was like working on book three, or I was working on book two, I mean, book two or three. I think but, it was three. Yeah, so I would have lost, uh, I, I would have lost everything. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, it would have been horrible. Yeah, yeah um, who was the guy that did the Xanth Chronicles? Uh, Piers Anthony. Okay, yes, Piers Anthony. You can tell it, 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 his Xanth series is like, I have no idea how long these things are. I stopped at some point. A lot of people stopped because you could tell in the latter books that the publisher was forcing him, his contract, uh, had him keep writing these books and you could tell in his writing that he was no longer having any fun writing this wonderful imaginative um series and it, it's you know so yeah read your contract definitely read your contract um now okay getting back to self-publishing or do we want to go more into um the publishing realm and, well and I don't stories. know. Let's see if, okay. uh, if anyone has any specific questions. Well, I'll keep rattling. And yeah, and go ahead and ask away. He'll stop me. Uh, <laughs> um, when it comes to self-publishing, like I said, you're in control of everything. So 
you have to worry about, sorry it's so dark, uh, maybe if I sit up straight, um, um, you're in control of everything. So when you uh, finish your story, you um, um, have to worry about, okay, what, uh, you know, your editor, uh, do you have an editor? Are you going to be using a program uh, for editing? And, I'm, and one of the things that, that we do to keep down cost um, is I actually have a program called Pro Writing. And I actually bought it when you could still buy a lifetime subscription and not have to rent it, which, hey, it's, it's, I have to admit, it's a really good program. And it catches things that... I can't, I can no longer see because let's face it, we, we go and we write something and if we don't clear our brain, you know, you know, leave it on the back burner for three months and, and forget what we're, you know, what it's about, go to something else. We go back and have to read through it again. And by the time you're finished, your brain is starting to auto correct big time. So a lot of times a good program will help you find those little ticky things. Um, I also have an audio program that I run all my stuff through because I'm, I can read upside down and backwards. Um, and that tends to cause, cause me issues because I will flip um, words and sentences and I don't, I can't see it, uh, but I can hear it. You know, so instead of saying, how are you? What I might have written was um, how you are. And it, it just is one of those things. We have a question. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about Amazon Kindle? No, I think they want to know Kindle Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited, okay. Um, yeah, I, we have all of our books on Amazon. Um, if you either go to the dealer's den or the author page, our website is listed and then it'll shoot you to wherever. Um, on Amazon, um, if you are interested in any of these books, um, the thing—it's—it's—it's—it's it, it's, it's, it's basically Amazon is your biggest store. So, you know, as much as I would love to be able to walk into the local bookstore, um, they just don't exist anymore in brick and mortar stores. Um, and if they do, it's one of these mammoth places where, you know, is it, is it, you know, half off books where, you know, I have to admit, I've never had a, 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 a good outcome when it comes to half price books um, in finding things. Uh, then you got Barnes and Nobles who, the, if it's a brick and mortar store, the books actually cost more at the brick and mortar store than they do online and that is just because they have to cover their cost yeah that, that sucks does, hmm? does that have to do with unlimited i'm getting to that oh. i'm getting to that okay so that with that being said um you can put you know it, it, it costs you nothing to put things on kindle um and then of course your your physical books you know Unless you, you know, buy some to sell at a convention, um, then you have to pay for your printing. Now, Kindle Unlimited, which I think this question is actually asking about, um, we've tried Kindle Unlimited with uh, one of our, our one-offs, and it just, it failed. Um, now, and uh, we also know a couple of people who are very successful um mainstream authors self-published who, when they tried Kindle Unlimited, um, they saw their, their sales just plummet because the thing with Kindle Unlimited, you don't buy the book outright. When it, when you, when you're just, when you buy the book outright, there's a set price, the author gets it. Um, it doesn't matter if the book sits on the Kindle for the next 20 years or the book gathers dust in a corner you know, unread, it's, it's sold. With Kindle Unlimited, you get pay, paid via the page. And so if, if you have something that is on Kindle Unlimited, you want to make sure when people grab it, 
um, they're going to read through it. And really, Kindle Unlimited is for the rabid readers. Yes, and the rate you get paid for that one page is much less than if they buy the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have seen Kindle Unlimited work if it's in a series. Yes. And, uh, so it really just depends on uh, how many voracious readers do you have? Like if you're a very, very long series, uh, it's not going to work well for you. If you have a trilogy, probably not. Um, if you have a one-off, don't do it. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. It's 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 really something that um, you have to experiment with. It works for other people uh, more than others. Yes, yeah, some people more than others. I'm starting to double talk. Sorry, it's mm -hmm. this is, we're into the second hour. Um, now, they also want to know uh, program suggestions. And yes, we have program suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, ask us in our dealer's den chat. And we'll or, or, I can, or, I can or I can type it up right here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do that. And then you can talk to them for a bit. Oh, good. I get to talk to people. Hi, people. <laughs> Actually, um, we love to do Amazon because we are kind of crossover. We do a lot of furry stuff. But we also do a lot of sci-fi and about half of our stuff crosses over. So we actually get a uh, no, we're not getting rich. It's more like a, a pizza or two pizzas a month um, based on royalties. Um, and But it gives us the control. And because we kind of pump out a lot of books, uh, we're not limited by uh, a publisher saying, no, I only want this. And I only want it this year. And you won't see it in print until I get around to it maybe next year. No, we need to keep going a little faster than that. And uh, the good thing is um, there's plenty of resources. If you want to learn how to market, um, you know, you want to uh, uh, find your own cover and uh, the reward is you get a product that makes you happy. Downside is you put in the work to make that product happen. You, nobody is going to help you with marketing. No one's going to help you uh, find an artist, uh, put together a, a, a good blurb and a, a good cover. It's all on you. But there uh, are there are resources out there that if you get into a good writers group. That can be a real good help. I mean, and, and I'm not talking about the people who go, "Oh, yeah, that's a wonderful story," and it 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 just is not. Yep. Um, I'm talking about somebody who will give you honest answers. And the Furry um, Writer Guild is pretty good at that. Yes, yes. Um, when it comes to book covers, um, Reed and I do not do. We we found out a long time ago that we just don't. Do very well with trying to figure out a book cover and we actually um, had um, we actually um, were put onto a very good uh, person who makes covers her, her name's Elizabeth Mackey and she did some amazing covers for us and you know here, here's one uh, right to belong and you can obviously tell that's that's a, a sci-fi and looks pretty furry or <laughs> and well, actually we have two covers for that book well yes yes because retail not retail cafe um yeah retail cafe well their sister company furry mystery box. furry mystery box they wanted to put um our book one of our books in their mystery box um and so sal did a a special cover for it as well as um inside uh, prints. So, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and in fact, Del did this cover for me. <laughs> Love his work. And Boo, uh, Caribou, 
is she's she's doing our post post parody covers and we're pairing her with elizabeth who then puts in the typography because um i'm not good at typography either and that's the the the, the wording and the banners and instead of a blurb on the back of of these ones we're, we're putting we're putting little you know 50s style ads like you know jose cuervo cocktail worms it's not a party without the worm um, yeah and you know Covers can cost, uh, uh, sometimes you get lucky and maybe a cover costs you 50 bucks, which is very, very That's cheap. super, 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 super cheap. cheap. Or <laughs> maybe your cover costs you 250. Uh, um, and sometimes some people uh, pay more. I mean, yeah, there, some, there's, some there, there's uh, we've known a couple of people who uh, they get an artist and, and I, I don't even want to think of how much they spend but they get it back in sales because the covers are so cool i just i want to faint every time i i hear the 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 astronomical number yes but a bad cover will sink a good book yes bad yes because the you know the old adage you know a people judge a book by its cover and you know, like haha it's who she i love the back of this <laughs> and if you're writing for if you're writing for multiples and your book can cross genres, you may need two covers because what that's works possible. for sci-fi won't work for furry. And and that's one thing we found when we did the uh, uh, Kawaki series. And this is this is very. I'll show you. You you can tell they're a series. <laughs> um, and. We have the furry version. I don't know where I put it. Uh, oh well. So it might it might have ended up at mom's house. I think it did. Okay. Um, but anyways, uh, when we were testing covers, because originally we were thinking, oh well, you know, we'll use Cell's cover and, and it'll be, and and he was willing to do it in the entire series, and we did a test run with a sci-fi group, and they thought it was middle grade. And some of the snide comments that came out of some of their mouths were <clears throat> very upsetting. So that's when we decided to do a more um, traditional type sci-fi cover and then have the Furry Mystery Box do a the, their specialty cover. And it, it kind of sucked because I, I really wanted to use Sal's um, sells artwork but it just didn't didn't uh, go for the quote-unquote um mainstream sci-fi crowd which was a real bummer um and uh yeah, that that's covers um one of the things you want to look at is okay we've done editing uh, it, it's always a good good thing to get a good beta reader or editor, even though you know, even though we we keep costs down with programs. One of the things that we try to do is we ha we try and have somebody, somebody a live person, um, read through our our books. And um, Andra, what what is her website? Um, I, I think I'd have to look it up. Yeah, again. I'd have to look it up. Um, um, but if you editors are not cheap um, at all, um, and so if you can get a good editor who fits you and your style of writing, that's another thing. Just because uh, you have an editor, you might not agree with your editor, or maybe they're editing for things you're not asking, you're not looking for. There's different types of editors. There is different types of editors. Some of them do um, just the uh, the grammar only, um, punctuation, um, sentence structure. Uh, then you have another editor which looks at you know, how is your story set up and looking at the plot points and seeing if there's some holes in your story. Um, and so you really have, when you when you go to find an editor, figure out what they're actually offering you and whether that's something you want. 
And another thing is do a test run with them of say the first chapter or the first 10 pages and see if they are um, compatible with you. Um, I happened to mention psychotic editors before, um, and here I will tell you one of my horror stories. I had a full length novel. You're talking, it was somewhere between 60 and 70,000 words. And without telling me, he went, I'm pretty sure it was a he, uh, cause I actually, I didn't meet him. I, we talked um, online and he went delete happy. And he took my dystopian, um, dark uh, novel and was trying to cram it down into a short story zombie flick. And it's like, as soon as I heard, saw the word zombie, I'm like, what is going on? And then I realized that they had deleted chunks of my story without telling me then turned around and said, well, why isn't this in there? Why isn't that in there? Uh, you, you deleted it, guy? Um, and then on top of that, he had the, the audacity to insult me and say, well, I don't have time to edit. Why are you editing that? Uh, so be very, very careful um, yeah. with, with your editors and finding a good one that, that suits you and what they are actually doing. Now, not many people on the Furry Writers Guild will do a, a, an edit of a full novel, but the Furry Writers Guild is great for beta readers. And you really can't trust a furry novel to a sci-fi or a romance reader. That is true. You'll get horrible, horrible suggestions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, though sometimes it is a good idea to have a beta reader or, 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 or somebody give you, you know, read your stuff because you might get a different perspective on it. Um, but yeah, in, in general, um, we've found, uh, what did the editor think he was playing at? I don't know what this guy was smoking. I, I honestly do not know. Um, but I... I almost stopped writing because of him. I wanted. I, I came. I came about that close to building a bonfire in my backyard. Um, yeah, I, I went ballistic. Um, anyways, <laughs> getting back to um, okay, we went through covers. You want a good cover? Um, oh, the thing about covers I wanted to, to say is, you want when it comes to doing a cover, if you're going to do it yourself not pay someone to, to do it who is is a professional cover maker um, make sure you can see the name of the book and your name and be careful of copyright issues and that's that's kind of what's nice when it comes to paying somebody else to do your cover for you um, including the artwork and the typography the, the wording and stuff um, because you know, they know um, Know, what is copywritten, what's not copywritten, and, you know, they're, this is their job. Um, so you, you do have that safeguard in there, because you don't want to have a really successful book and find out, hey, this, so, this is copywritten, and then get slapped with, the, with a lawsuit, um, which I don't know of anybody that actually has happened to, but do you really want to run the risk? Just saying. Um, so that was cover editing, um, what else we, uh, formatting. Um, there are p places where you can go to, to get your, um, uh, your book formatted. I, I'm old fashioned. I do it myself. Um, now I could actually buy a program that formats the, the book for me. I, I think uh, Scrivener, I think, has a formatting tool in it. Um, there's a couple of other things. Um, any issues between legal name versus pen name? Not that I know of, but I do know, I would be careful about being, shall we say dickish? 
there was a, a author I stumbled across who, the author name was Preston Child. And of course, my brain automatically thought, ooh, Preston and Child has a new book. You know, because these are two separate authors, you know. Um, Lincoln Child and uh, whatever his first name is, Preston. You know, and I thought, great, you know, they've got a new book and I want to get this whole entire series. And come to find out, it was somebody whose actual name or pen name was Preston W. Child. And he didn't bother putting that W in there until like the fifth book. And when I got the first book, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. This ain't right. So, you know, do be careful with your pen names. Um, but I I don't know of any horror stories when it comes to pen names. Um, well, I've, you, I've, I have two pen names. Um, well, you have three. Three? Yes, you have three. Well, technically, Stacey Bender is my uh, uh, real name, so I can't really call it a pen name. Okay, okay, fine. Two, five. Okay, so, and I, I wrote two um, cozy mysteries under my middle name, which is Catherine, so it was Catherine Bender, which was Body in the Boot and Dead Letter from Falcon Mysteries, because I wanted to keep them separate from my sci-fi, and I, I wanted, I, I didn't want people to get confused, and that's part of the reason when I did, when I, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing my, my Coached parodies, those are all furry books. Um, I'm using um, Purple Cat Hatter, PC Hatter, uh, because I did also did not want to get that confused um, with my my my, my uh, sci-fi stuff because the poached parodies um, are are geared toward a, a furry audience. Uh, my main character in Kaiser Wrench is a tiger. Um, in the, uh, just after World War II, so it's, it's like late 40s, early 50s. Um, now, uh, the, two the, the, the two other um, poach parodies that are not out yet, that won't be out until next year, um, is Lucius Anorak, which is a, a uh, Siberian husky, which is also another detective. Um, and... He's, he's also, uh, during that time period, these are all uh, on the Noor mystery side. Um, and then Lizard Fifth is going to be just five books of, of, of lizards. And, yeah, so and, if you had written all of them under one name, you would have sci-fi people going, well, what's this furry mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's a big difference. I mean, you get, you got sci-fi, and then you've got furry, and then you've got cozy mystery, and I didn't really want to mix them up, though I have to admit, in the inside cover, I put in there PC Hatter, um, also known as, um, and, uh, oh, by the way, Caribou does, is doing the covers for that, she's absolutely wonderful, um, and uh, I think I, I, I already mentioned that, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> um, but as long as, as it's not somebody else's famous name, there shouldn't really be a, an issue. At least I would hope not. Um, okay, so we got covers, we've got through editing, uh, formatting, um, cover blurb. You know, that, that's another thing. You can pay somebody else to do your back cover blurb. I've actually seen advertisements. And, and, and quite honestly, you can pay somebody to do, you know, to write the story through the editing all the way to marketing. But it's going to, you know, how much do you really, really want to spend? And if you're, if you're dealing with a budget, that's, that's, that's another thing you want to look at with self-publishing. What is your finances? What can you do yourself? Um, what is your strong suits? What, what can you learn um, to do? And then what can you just not have the skills for? And, you know, Reed and I, you know, our skills are, you know, I can do the, the I do the, um, a lot of the editing and the, uh, well, he also does a lot of the editing too. Um, 
but I do the formatting. Um, we bounce back and forth on the cover blurbs, um, which um, four things you really want to pay attention to when doing a back cover blurb is um, who's your main character? What do they want? Why can't they get it? Uh, what what's going to happen if they can't get what you know they want? And usually yeah. there's a bit of a catch there, a catchphrase too. Um, you try to make the first uh, the first sentence the the hook. The... Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so there there's that. And uh, one of the things uh, that we've both said before is we're not good at cover art or, or basically covers period and that's why we hire um, somebody who knows what they're doing who knows the copyrights who who can put together these wonderful covers and make them look good because I can, I can honestly tell you if I had to do it myself um, it is not going to look good <laughs> I just do not have the eye for that um, and uh, so let's see, editors. What am I missing? I know I'm missing something. I can't think of it. Marketing. <laughs> oh, marketing. Yeah, marketing is absolutely miserable. And again, you can hire somebody to do your marketing, or you can figure out how to do it yourself. And marketing is going to be different. Depending on your genre, depending on you uh, on what you write, it's it's what works for somebody may not work for somebody else. Um, there is we tried uh, what was it? What was that free uh, um, free free booksy, free booksy and it did not work at all for sci-fi. Um, it did not. It didn't really. It didn't even work for for the cozy mysteries. In fact. Um, we had an issue with MailChimp because of, of that, um, that website where, um, uh, MailChimp was, was getting, had a hissy fit with me on, they thought I was spamming people. And I was like, no, I mean, these people wanted a free book. And then in the first, my first email out to say, hi, how you doing? And people just, you know, went off the, the, the mailing list, like rats off, yeah, unsubscribed, um, like rats off a sink, sinking ship. Um, and I was like, okay, what's going on here? So I sent out another email to tell people, Hey, I don't want to bother you. Um, if you really don't want, you know, if you if you really want to get an email from me, either re-sign up yourself or tell me and I will put you on this list. Um, because I really don't, don't want to bother you. Um, I got some interesting um, responses. Uh, some people, you know, obviously those who didn't want to didn't want to be on the list. Most of them, you know, didn't even bother getting back with me. So those were kind of obvious. Um, some of them said, Hey, you know, sorry that this happened to you. Uh, sure. I'll go back and, and, and re-sign up or yes, put me back on the list. And then I got some real interesting, like, um, one of them actually said, uh, well, you know, you should be glad that I, I, I took your book for free, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, uh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, there were there were some interesting people out there, and you know, you 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 sometimes giving away a book free helps promote your book, and then sometimes you're just dealing with digital hoarders. Um, you know, and and the the hope is a lot of times that you you can get reviews on your book. Well. Like I said, if you have, if you are giving your book away to digital hoarders, they're never going to be read. You're you're not you're not going to get any of your reviews. And um, another quick side note: um, any book that you get from an author, please, please, please review it. Um, 
if, if, if you can't review it in Amazon, put it in Goodreads or, or wherever, because reviews, even if it's, if, even if you just say, hey, I liked this book, it does help. Um, because the more reviews an author has, the, the more um, that the algorithms will, will push them closer to the top to get seen more. And if you really like a particular author, Please review your review their book. You know, no matter no matter who's writing it, yes. And good. Sometimes it doesn't even matter whether it's a bad review or a good review. Now, sometimes the bad reviews make you know someone's book look more legit. Um, sometimes <laughs> don't don't do it unless you actually hate the book. <laughs> Please. Um, uh, audiobooks. Audiobooks is another thing that. We have tried a lot of our books um, are actually on audio with Audible. Um, and we've kind of had hit or miss with this. Um, there are people who just like ebooks. There's pers other people who, who like that physical book. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm one of them because if I don't have that physical book, I tend to forget I have it. Um, though audiobooks, I do like uh, listening to because I, then I can I can do other things with my hands um, while I'm listening to a story. Um, a lot of and, people like them because they drive a lot. Yes, a lot of people who who are long distance drivers, or say if they're they if they're joggers, or there's a lot of people out there that do like audiobooks because they can do other things while they're listening. Um, and it, it helps fill the, fill the time and, and, and everything. And so several of our books are on, uh, our sci-fi books and the Cozy Mysteries are on um, Audible. Um, but again, if you don't have the reviews, you don't really, you know, you don't, get pushed to the top of, of the algorithm. Um, and then there's the finding a reader. I do not read my own stuff because I just, I'm not good at it. You, you don't want me to read my own stuff. You don't want me to read anybody's stuff. Um, but a good reader um, for your novel is a um, if you're going to do it is paramount because you don't want to get someone who is not a very good reader reading your story. Otherwise, you know, no one's going to want to read it. Um, we, when we first started doing this, we got really, really lucky uh, with uh, a guy named Theo Holland. He was willing to do a royalty share, which means we don't have to pay. We don't put, we didn't put out any money. Uh, he did all the work and, but he, for everything that was sold, he got a cut. And of course, I think his, uh, I think at the time they were doing 40%. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, Audible took their cut and then we got the, the residual, which, hey, we were happy that, you know, someone would, you know, get one of the books. Um, so we had no problem with that because we knew we were not, you know, any of the big names. So shelling out, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars for a, an Audible audio reader we knew we weren't going to get that. We didn't think we were going to get that money back. We didn't want to take that chance. And we, of course, did not have that in our budget. So when you know, agreed to do the, the royalty share, that worked out great. Um, and Lord only knows how much uh, he has had to go through. I didn't realize how much a reader has to go through um, to do these audio books. And it's interesting because, you know, they have to have a particular room. They have to have the right equipment. They have to have right, the right um, programs. And there's a lot, a lot of work that goes into being a reader for an audiobook. And you know, the more I found out about it, the, the more fascinating it was. I, I just it amazes me that anybody does royalty share, but I'm glad they do. A lot of people will do it because they're just trying to get into the business and is and are not a name, so they're looking for stuff to put on the resume. 
Uh, now there's something that is also called a, um, um, it's not when you pay them outright. There, there's like three different things you can do. You can do a royalty share, which you share royalties in the books being sold. Then there's the, you pay the person outright, which can get very expensive, especially for a bigger name reader. And then you have like a hybrid between the two where you pay a certain amount uh, to the, the, um, to the reader. And then they also still get some of the royalties that, you know, come from selling your books. Uh, and that is a new thing that Audible put in, was it? This year, I think it was last year they implemented that. Um, let's see, uh, Rita, let's see. We live with the reader he did not like. <laughs> yes, I can imagine he had a, a few issues with the dogs. Um, high quality sound recording at home is tricky. Yes, I can under, yeah. Choose stuff. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, getting, getting a, a reader is, is hard. Um, and you know, like, like I said, it, if, if you're going for a royalty share, you're probably going to get somebody who is trying to get their foot into the business and make a name for themselves. Um, but even that is, could be kind of iffy. Now, especially now with, with, with the changes uh, that they've made. Um, and I, I think we didn't really cover that much on marketing. I, I bumped over to uh, audio um, Audible and we have eight minutes left, I think. Um, so if anybody has a question, hurry up and, and, and put your questions in and I will um, Buzz back to what? And, and you can just like hold up the book and give them a blurb on uh, each one since we're kind of waiting for them to uh, ask a question. Oh. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, should I do the blurb? Yes, you're, you're, the, you're the better sales. Okay, okay. Um, Koyoki is a first contact uh, alien. Um, Jasmine Char is on her way to uh, a world where the call virus emanated from. Uh, these fox-like creatures uh, are very primitive, but they seem to have the answer to the genetic uh, virus that's sweeping the universe. Okay. Uh, I guess we should get the... Why don't you just do the Kaiser Ranch thing? <laughs> I gotta find the first one first. I, I I tossed them on the table to you know, thinking that oh, um, we might um, excuse excuse the the bar across the top. It says uh, you know not for resale. These are the proof copies that we got a hold of. Um, uh, like I said, I'm I'm doing a furry nor um, by the tribunal. Uh, I'm calling them poached parodies because they are parodies of um, some famous authors uh, from back in the day, um, which you know, it's interesting to, to know that some of the, their books are still in print, even after a, almost a hundred years, which is kind of cool. Um, but I, the tribunal uh, kicks it off uh, with uh, a character I'm, I'm calling Kaiser Wrench. He's a tiger. Um, Reed likes to to say, "Hey, you know, move over my camera." There's a there's a, uh, a, a, new, a, new, PI a new PI in town, and he's no pussycat. Um, and he, I have to admit, when I did the parody, I did it was actually quite easy because the the person that they're based off of was is considered a outside civilized society type of person so it was very very easy to convert them into a a furry parody um whereas and that was um mickey splains my camera um so i've i've now you know called them uh yeah, I, even the titles 
uh, are a parody of the original yes. title. For instance, uh, Kiss Me Deadly is Pet Me Fatal. Uh, Every, everybody loves that one. Uh, and I, oh, the by, jury, by, the, by the way, uh, parody laws, uh, you have to change at least 20, 20 or 25% um to make it a parody so i just wanted to say yeah. that and on the back of the books if you get the physical there's a cute little 50s ad like i um, I, I already mentioned that and then, okay forget i won't mention it again. but they're just so <laughs> they're just so humorous. he, he love loves them. them he loves them and okay yes we have the well five minute warning about a minute ago uh oh uh, is there anybody who has any questions we have Four minute, um, about four minutes left to go, um, and I, I, I kind of feel bad that I was self promoting, but <clears throat> yes, we have a few books. But thank you all <laughs> for for joining me through this, joining us through this. It was very much fun presenting to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much fun. And next time, let's see, what's the square? <laughs> That's a you question. <laughs> uh, I times two. Mm-hmm. Square root of negative four. <laughs> you two have been. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that the, the video is a bit dark, but um, our, our light is not that bright. And my computer's old. <laughs> 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 Good point, good point. Um, all right. Mood lighting. <laughs> all right, and glad to have, glad, glad to, glad to be here. And I definitely, I definitely have been having fun. And uh, when, the, when the conventions start up again, just look for the hat or the dragon. <laughs> We better sign off. Thank you much.